I'm Daniela, I'm from Brazil, and I do, do I need to look to the camera or to you? Sorry. You can look to me or sometimes look to him, and okay. that's fine. So my name is Daniela, I'm from Brazil, I live in Sao Paulo, where I work at a place called the House of Digital Culture, and I'm also part of a community for uh, activism, for openness and transparency and politics, that's called Transparency Hackers. Okay, cool. Yeah. My name is Pedro, also from Brazil. Actually, I've been working with Daniela for quite some time now on all those issues on how to raise political awareness and how to develop apps which uh, increase the amount of transparency and political power from people, for instance. So you are a coder? Your background is coder? Uh, yeah, I needed to become a coder in order to do that. I was at that first, but I have been learning for quite some yeah. time. How would you describe the digital community here and then especially the hacker community or activist community here in Brazil? Is it a huge community? I think the hacker culture has a lot of characteristics that are very common to Brazilian culture somehow. So people here are flexible and like to find other ways to get things done. And some people speak of that in a very bad way, as if it was a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all, and I think it's something very great, and it's also part of the hacker culture, because it has something about being creators and finding odd new ways of getting things done. So I think that's one of the reasons why this hacker culture and the internet culture is strong here in Brazil. And it's getting broader, like we're getting more people on board, because the country is getting more developed and people are getting more connected. It is lower than we wanted, but it is still happening. And it's also very strong because it, we share many values with this country. Yeah, I, I think theoretically it's huge. I mean, we have uh, uh, people who are committed to activism, digital activism and such, are really committed in Brazil. But in practical terms, uh, we don't have enough developers in open source software for instance, even though Brazil is recognized as like one of the biggest country with supports, open source and stuff, if you go to the actual numbers of like how many people are contributing to Linux, for instance, or to other open source products, uh, then the, the picture is not so clear. But I do think that we, as Brazilian, if, if we can create this kind of distinction, uh, uh, thus uh, we do share like lots of interest in common things with the digital activist, hacktivist culture. I also think that we are going through the process of getting some legitimacy to all that in the country. So what happens is people did a lot by themselves here. So the way people got connected to the internet in Brazil is much more through building cyber cafes and houses in a very cheap way, in a very creative way, instead of having money and having a computer on your house. So we know that that happens much more. And there was not, I think it would be very impossible for government to create an action that we get everybody on the internet collaborating, but people somehow found a way to do that. Because it's, it's important to have access to things. If that is legit to the system, I don't think that's totally true by now. I think we're getting through this process of looking to those things and seeing much value on them. Are there any initiatives from the government side to get everybody online? Yeah, we have a major like broadband plan which is taking shape right now and it's there has been some struggle between the telecom companies and the activists because uh, the plan was supposed to get everybody online and now it's starting to change into something which is supposed to get much more money to the telecom uh, yeah. company. So. Well, we're in the middle of the struggle right now. Infrastructure just raises so many conflicts because there's a lot of money involved. And then the companies get close to the government and then the deals start to go towards different directions. Mm -hmm. Many, many of, many of the actions that people are taking to get online here in Brazil, not only to get online, but to get cable TV, to get electricity in some places, are illegal because there's not the offer. So now, there are people that are trying to make that in a more structured way, offering special sorts of plans that people can pay with less money. But even though 
it is still it's shaky. Now mm. now time the big interests are, are being mm. discussed. So. I mean Sao Paulo is here the biggest city in Brazil. Does it take any kind of lead? How does it look like if you go to Rio de Janeiro or if you go to the countryside? Is well, there any kind of activism out there? What what about do you have any idea how connected the people are there if you go into smaller cities? Yeah. So not saying that Rio is really a small city. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. But I mean, even Sao Paulo, I mean, Brazil is a really crazy place because Sao Paulo, which is the biggest city in Brazil and one of the biggest cities in the world, uh, in downtown where we are right now, we don't have cable television and we don't have cable internet access. So, because it's not profitable for the company to get. So, even in the heart of the biggest city in Sao Paulo, we still have infrastructure problems. We have uh, only one company serving internet connection. And this is of good quality. Oh no, it's Telefonica. Yeah, it's only it's one, and it's crazy because yeah. then you don't. That's the option that you have. So if when we moved to our office, it took four months for us to have internet because they were they were not. We didn't have the offer, even though it's downtown Sao Paulo. And there is a demand, you are saying there yeah, is exactly. a demand. Yeah, exactly. There is we a big demand. We think there is a demand, but the demand was not big enough for the market, and that's why those things can't be regulated only by the market. You need some other kind of wheel. Yeah. Making it Still, uh, Sao Paulo is obviously the big hub which connects, uh, and, and we do have like a much bigger, uh, in terms of quantity, uh, not even talking about quality here, but raw numbers of activists and digital companies and people who are driven on this online world. Uh, everything is happening in Sao Paulo. But that's not to say that we don't have this in other places, even in like a uh, weird place where you would not expect that. Like in the north region of Brazil, in the middle of the Amazon forest, you have a place there which called Santarém, which has like some really savvy and like really uh, uh, powerful activists who are using the digital to transform and shape their local reality. In Rio, we have some really interesting groups, but Rio, Sao Paulo, and the South of Brazil is kind of a cluster because we have the money, we have the infrastructure, we have the access. We have attention. Yeah. Uh, in the smaller cities, uh, of course, you have smaller amount of debt, but I still think it's it's. Uh, I would say it's more distributed now because of the internet than it was 10 years ago. So it's not to say that the problem is solved, we still have to work a lot to, to lower these barriers, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the internet has made a huge difference in connecting people and groups. And I wouldn't even say about uh, localization, like geographic communities less so, but like interesting groups, like the indigenous people in Brazil have been in a movement to get connected really uh, uh, in a powerful way, the, the Quilombola movement. Uh, so you have all those movements we are, which are taking the web for themselves to use as an asset, as a tool to get their message through. What about the costs of being connected? Are they very high? They are some of the highest in the world from what I hear. Yeah. It's, they are very, very high, yeah. comparable to many other countries. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's way too much. I mean, the economic growth of Brazil in the last 10, 15 years was quite unusual. I mean, they really started to take off. Uh, what happened to the communities here while, I mean, you know, economic wealth came? Not to everybody. I mean, when you walk through. Rio, when you walk through Sao Paulo, as far as I've seen, there's still yeah. a lot of poverty. So, uh, how do you think can this enormous economic growth go along with fulfilling social obligations? When you look from the from the uh, government side, that's a matter that's totally connected to sharing power. I think, and this is the this is the major problem. I think the country has been growing and economically. I wish we were using a different model than what we have seen outside, and I don't think that's entirely true. 
because we saw many nations growing and we saw them breaking afterwards. And I do think that we need to change our model somehow. We need to make this more sustainable. Of course, I don't have the answer of how to do that, but I all, but I think that unfortunately it didn't change much of the thought that people have to be autonomous and they have to be capable to grow in also in a more sustainable way. And that's totally related to sharing power and we don't see much of that in Brazil. So for a country that has been growing so much, we still have things happening here that just would drop your mouth. It's just, how, how can that be happening? So what's happening in the Amazon now that they're building this huge power plant? Yeah. Uh, and many, many, many people have studied that and many people say this is a threat to the culture, to the diversity, to the people that live in the area, to the environment. And it still has to be done. It has to be done to support the model of development that we have now. But it's not consider considerative to the people that live in the area. It's not, it doesn't consider anything like the culture, their cultural diversity and the environment. So how can that still be happening? And it's happening. And we are not able to stop it by this point. And one of the reasons is because we don't know this political process at all. This thing is being built and we have no idea how it's being done and nobody's going to release information about that. So how can you make a balance between the power of people that can take a pen and sign a paper that this is going to happen in Brazil and those people they're just living in an area and they don't have access to decisions about it anymore and we still didn't get to that point here in Brazil. Mm. I think that's one of the reasons that wh why we work so focused on transparency because I think it's key. I think people getting to know how things work can be key for us to be able to share power and share wellness and share development after that. Yeah, yeah. we're coming back to this transparency thing later. I would like to uh, put one more question in between. When you say you were looking at, at countries outside Brazil, what are the countries you think, or which countries would you name as role models which you would like to follow? I mean, this Western model of capitalism is kind of not collapsing, but there are weak points we have all over the Western world, those Occupy uh, yeah. movements which go exactly in the direction which you were just mentioning. So, if you would consider a country a role model for Brazil? I, I don't think we have any role models. I, I mean, can't do that either. Uh, I, I could point some, some countries in which some of the issues we are struggling now are somewhat resolved, like Finland and those really low corrupt kind of countries, but I don't think the formula that they have would ever work for a country in the right. size of Brazil uh, with the kind of uh, difficulties we struggle here. So I think they, they, they reach out a point which is really interesting, but I don't think that, uh, I don't think that I don't think that they serve as a role model. I, I'm pretty sure that the, the best model that, the best role model that I can come up with is the Occupy movement themselves. I think those are the countries we should follow in the sense that they are at least acknowledging that we need to stop, or not even stop, but to, to rethink everything. We don't even know where we want to go right now, but we are pretty sure that it's not where we are going. And this is something that I think Brazil uh, especially because of the economic growth, has not acknowledged yet. Like as a, as a whole, most of Brazilians and most of people are like comfortable. Like, no, we are cool. We are like growing, and it, growing is not enough for me. Yeah, and I think I I don't think it 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 sounds terrible when you say that, but I don't see anything outside there that is better than what we have now here. I don't think we live in a world of models anymore. I think people of will models. of models, like yeah. you can't have, yeah. there's nothing that you can copy, anything, if what's ready outside there was good, we would be in a better situation, the whole world as we are now. Not even, I don't even think that people, countries as Pedro saying, that, were, that are very developed in their democracy, I don't, if, I don't even think that democracy is that big thing in the moment, because what democracy is, democracy is a model that 
creates majorities of people that can decide and minorities that can't. Okay, I mean, we don't see that. We already know that we are the 99% and we are not deciding anything, so our democracies are failing. But even though, even though our democracies were a huge success and 99% of the people were living well and the way they wanted, what about the 1%? And we know it's not only 1%. Like in Brazil, we see that a lot. This is a country that has many countries inside of it, as many other big countries in the world, but in a very special and intriguing way because things are really mixed up. So when you have that diversity of people and culture and people that wish they do things in a different way, how can you have that in a system that only considers that what 51% of the people want? Mm. So I don't think that we have anything ready out there for us. Mm. We need to experiment a lot and you need to lose the fear of experimenting in order to do that. I think this is a very important point what you just mentioned because my next question was going in this way. If we do have these movements like Occupy Wall Street or what we have seen in the Arab world, to connect people and to get them out there is one thing. But how do you think and I mean, you know, making people aware in Rio de Janeiro about the Olympics that some things aren't going right and the World Cup, you know, is actually fueling the 1%, not the 99%. Uh, we all know this and people are ready to protest against it and they can connect, they can make these things visible. They even come on the huge TV stations, they are broadcast, everybody knows it. But what are the steps we need to take out of these movements to really make something sustainable happen? What do you see there? And you said in the very first beginning that the culture here in, in, in Brazil is a lot like the, what we see in the hacker culture. Yeah. So do you think Brazilians might have, because of their cultural background, an advantage? Maybe in comparison to China? They, the way I see that is that I think Occupy movements in many different countries are more, co are more connected among themselves than they are connected to the structure of the states where they are at. I don't think that's a problem. I think that's only a situation. So it's, it's, it's funny when you just, you just said like which countries can be like the models for Brazil and I don't even can see that. That's one of the reasons because I think now, in this world that we are living now, you have a lot of that. You have the possibility of being in Spain in an occupying movement and being in Egypt. And all of a sudden, you have, we're sharing more common values than you are with the people in, within your own country. But I think there's also something tricky there. That's the fact that we need to get our actions somewhat connected to what's, what is the power structure that we are part of at this moment. Then transparency comes up one more time because we should be understanding political process so well that we could be more strategical in the ways we're going to act in order to act in a very precise way that can crash or rebuild the system. What do you mean when you say we? When I say we, I say all of us, pretty much. I think I think that's that's I think that's for. People who are working over public interest issues day by day, no matter what it is, you need to understand that very well in order to take actions that can be more strategical and that can change the system somehow. Is it only public interest or I would add economic interest? I mean, this is, yeah, yeah, sure. this yeah. is what causes Economic the interest for me is somewhat public interest. It's like, okay. I'm just like, when you have a will that's not individual, if you're a teacher and you're working at a school and you want to get people educated in a better way than they were educated before, isn't that public interest? I think it is. And I think you shouldn't look at that as such like an individual or I'm going to be, or on a voluntary sort of work. That, that can be big if you get connected not only to other people that want to do the same, that you're doing, but if you also understand the system that you're part of and how you can act mm. within this system in order to make the entire system better. So both of you are very active in this transparency kind of thing. How did you get in there and what are the projects you're working on? Well, I think for me it's pretty straightforward the history. Uh, in the last election for the mayor of Sao Paulo, 
I was at... Um, that was four years ago. Four years ago. I was at the pub drinking beer and complaining about my mayor protesting. And people love to do that. They love to argue and, and shout on Twitter how things are not going well. And at the same time I was doing that, uh, a few minutes ago I was just praising how the internet is this awesome tool which can change reality and which can change things. And then I realized that I was saying that the internet could change things, but I, was, I wasn't doing actually. I wasn't doing nothing. So I had no rights to complain. So I decided, okay, I'm going to start working with this. I'm going to start changing the political system because if I do believe that the internet can change the music industry, why it couldn't change politics? And a little bit after that, Daniela was doing her thesis on the transparency and the public sphere and how the internet got along with all those tools and we start working with that and building on this idea and I think that's where the hacker component comes in that you can act on politics instead of protest, instead of talk about in the same way there's no hacker in the world who would actually protest against the DVD protection system it, hack it. it just goes there and hack it so I think that's what we should apply to our kind of activism and that's what we have been trying to do instead of just protesting against something let's try to find some way and to do that in order to do that you have to deeply understand the system because that's what the hacking of the DVD protection system was about so you act very local yeah, we have, we, we have been acting uh, both, and this is always uh, a difficult and tough decision whether you're going to act in a specific and really local subject or try to act on a more broader national level policy kind of stuff. I think we act, we act less locally than I would like to. I think we did less local and small and focused things than maybe I wish we had done. Because a lot of what we have been doing since we beginning on that is community building somehow. And not, not in a very intentional way, but we, were, we had this idea that we could use the internet to have more transparency and on that way changing politics. To get people to understand government. What if the government was not only a system inside the government, but it was a system owned by all of us in our computers? What would happen? And inside this idea, like, we were freaking out, think every, thinking every day many reasons of how can we work over that. We couldn't do that alone. <laughs> so we started to do things that could gather people around this idea. And that's when the whole community thing came out. So many of the projects that we are related to today were not projects made by us. They are projects that were made by many other people that somehow became connected to this community that we are part of that started in a simple event, that one day we set a date and sent an open call to the internet and people showed up. I also want to change politics using the tools that are available on the internet. Or I don't even like politics, I just like coding, so I showed up. That happens too. Mm, but just to get to three like, concrete, concrete projects we have been working on this past few years, uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have written a law the, the law of uh, access of information in Brazil, it has the several. Law of what? Uh, Freedom of Information Act, like the, okay. the access of inf uh, the right to the access information in Brazil. We didn't have a law that addressed this issue. Now we have, and in this law project, we do have uh, several paragraphs which was written by our community, because some uh, congressman come to us and said, "Okay, you have been talking about all this." Transparency issues. Uh, there is a law coming by. Do you do you do you think it addresses your issues? You say, well, you know what? We don't know. Let us take a look. No, it does not. This law is crap. Okay, so what can I do? Said the congressman. I said you should put that, that, and that. And that this is very unusual, isn't it? That something like this happens. I mean, it's. I think it's wonderful. It's happening, but this is not the usual path, is it? Ah, uh, no. Not at all, it's a hackish pack. So we hack it into the law. Uh, because then he answered, yeah, okay, but I don't know how to write those things. 
you either write for me or I can put it in the law. Uh, that's odd. I never write a law before. So we sit in on, on, on our office and said, okay, we have to, to write this. So we wrote a mail, uh, an email to the mailing list, which is the community basis, and said, guys, we need to write this law. What's missing? Okay, this and that and that. So we actually, and this all online and all open and everybody can see, there is this process when everybody came together to craft a better law. And we put that and it got approved by the Congress. It got approved. Yeah, it, it got, got so it's and amazing. What was missing in the law was, it had many things that are important for access to information, but it didn't have things that would make it updated, such as open data. So what, can you see the big change in having access to information if you live in Brasilia, if you can knock at the door of a federal uh, body and ask it for the information that you want, or if you are on the internet and you need this information somehow, and you need that. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between those things. Specifically, yeah. what are you going to use it for? Are you only going to see it, or do you want to use it to build new things, mm -hmm. to build projects on the internet? So that's the change that this bill needed, and that's how we could add suggestions for that, and actually actual parts of the text, and I think that was surprising. But I don't think that's unusual at all. I think that happens a lot for people that know how to lobby very well. In Brazil, we are very scared of this word. Lobbying is not even regulated. What and do you mean it's not even... We don't have a... You can't have a lobby. You can, you can be a professional lobbyist in Brazil. And this is sometimes considered corruption. So if say someone is doing it's making lobby, you can you can even get punished for that. If it if it could, if it includes money, it's a very bad thing. But we know it happens and that's actually what not only companies should be doing. I am pretty sure telecommunication companies have written their little pieces of bills and laws of Brazil. I am pretty sure that FIFA, FIFA wrote a huge law for Brazil that's going to be there as soon as we have the World Cup. And it's going to take away many of our rights as Brazilian citizens. So why not us? Why not Absolutely. we? We're not everybody. That was one thing. And then yeah, that's, that's one of the projects. Uh, the other project, and it all came up together, like we are doing projects on a need basis. It is the kind of the game of life of the uh, law projects. So we created this website where you can see a law proposition goes by just as if it was a game of life. Like, okay, so it stayed at this congressman for 30 days and then it jumped to the next phase and then it got uh, commented by this other congressman and then it goes all the way back to the beginning of the game so that people can understand better how does this process work. Because one of the things that we uh, understood after a while is that well, there is a specific path that a law proposition should go to. There is a system which is regulated by a lot of different laws and regulations. And congressmen and professional lobbyists and big companies and lawyers, they do know how does that stuff work. And they do know how to make this work in their favor. We don't. We, regular citizens, we, small social movements with an agenda. So the idea was to create a system which would empower people in the way that, okay, in a few months, this is going to pass by this specific house. So we need to address this guy mm -hmm. and get him in our side today, and not only in the, the, the day after, uh, the, the week they voted, before yeah. they vote. So this is an, uh, like a web application, and it's kind of working, it's still buggy, we're still working on that. And the last project, and then address different kind of projects, is the Hacker Bus, which we just bought a few months ago with crowdfunding. And it's a bus, like a regular uh, traveling bus, which we can put a lot of hackers inside and drive through Brazil. And the main idea behind this, this project is to decentralize from Sao Paulo, and it has to do with what we were talking before. How are we going to get this knowledge? How are we going to get these technologies out of the Sao Paulo downtown into smaller cities in which not only they are more needed in some sense, but they would also be more effective mm -hmm. because people are working into a really small uh, community. So 
if they connect people, this can be really more powerful than in Sao Paulo, where you have to connect like two, three million people in order to have some effect. Mm -hmm. Are your parents understanding what you are doing? Uh, it took a while, but right now my father is working with me in my office, so uh, it took a really long time to explain, especially because it does take a long time to explain, but uh, after a while my father got it and he's done working with me, which is really cool. I think my case is a little different, because my parents, they teachers, they've worked in public service all their lives, but in a very structured way. And we don't work in a very structured way, so it's difficult to explain what it is. They they are supportive of it, but it's it, it takes it takes more. And it's it. I think it's a very important question, though, because I think we fail on that most of times. It's very difficult to explain what I do. Not only to, to my mom and my dad, it's easier because they're closer to me. But what about my other relatives? And if they're not understanding anything. <laughs> or ordinary. Don't we have a problem? Ordinary is moms yeah. and dads. So yes. Yeah. So it's I. I think we 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 do need to get that better. But I also think that we are working. We are doing a lot of stuff in a very high speed. So we are taking with us people that are just getting on board, and then we go and go 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 go, and many things get behind, like explaining better what you're doing. I think I'm absolutely sure we need to take care of that, but I also think that this expertise is going to come along with us in the process. Yeah, so my very last question, because I'm running out of battery here, is <laughs> I have to leave. Uh, how can we build? I mean, this is a subject I was talking a lot to these young activists in Egypt. I spent two months almost in Egypt last year. and. Uh, I got the feeling, you know, if they don't get out of their cocoon, they're probably going to make the same mistake Mubarak did, just in a different way. So they think they are the new elite. They think how, you know, to teach how things need to be get done. But how can we manage that it's really a we? I mean, you are talking mainly for your generation. You know, how can we manage that this we is really... I understand what you mean, and I think it's great that you use the word elite for that, because I, I used to say that all the time. We cannot afford the price of being an elite anymore. We can't make all these things become a technocracy, where tech-safe people are going to understand any, everything and other people won't. In our daily process of work, what we try to make is m making everything in an open and transparent way as, as more as we can do it. So it's not only about blogging about your doing, but it's like doing things while people are watching you. So having discussion on open mailing lists instead of only exchanging emails with people that you know. I think in a, in a broader way, it also takes a bit of that, of transparency, but we also need to learn how to share knowledge. When the hacker bus goes to places, the hacker bus doesn't take anything. And we try the maximum to not create a super structure for the bus. And to, we don't want it to have a product that gets to the place very ready and done. So we get there, we have all these tools and it's flashy and people get there and they look at it and they go away. It goes, it is pretty much empty. We get there with a bus with a bunch of people that know how to do some stuff, but they don't know the local realities of, of that specific area. And we have a tent. And that's it. So I think. There's something really important that needs to be said. We don't, or at least I don't really care, and I don't really want to talk to anybody like how you should behave. Because you said that about the, the, the elite Arabian uh, activists, and that's not what we do. What we do is like we do stuff. It's mainly based on like doing stuff rather than talking on how stuff yeah, should be done. True. This is really different. So as long as we are doing stuff, and that's one of the reasons why, why I, I, I have the right to say, like, don't bother me with things that I should be doing because I'm doing a lot of stuff. If you have time to bother me on things I should be doing, you could do it Go yourself. Or yeah. you could do it with me. So uh, that, that's one of the main things that save us from that. Thank you to both of you.